This evening, we have, as we mentioned, seven questions we're going to try to get through. Uh, so I may talk a little faster, and you'll just have to listen faster. Uh, so let's get started with the first one. Regarding gifts from God, does one have to be saved in order to use them or know that he and she has them to use? Well, first we assume that uh, the person asking the question is not talking about spiritual gifts because uh, it would be pretty hard not to know that you had those from God. Uh, so we assume that we're talking about uh, various talents and gifts uh, that we might possess and do they come from God? Yes, they do, through natural means. Uh, take, for example, King Cyrus that we just noticed in Isaiah uh, chapter 44. Whatever talents King Cyrus had that made him king, he received them through God, uh, through natural means. And this is the case with everybody we all have talents and gifts that essentially are from God. Uh, they were not bestowed upon us in a miraculous way. We uh, maybe have had them throughout our lives, and maybe we have uh, worked on them to make the, them even better. Take, for example, Goliath. He had a certain amount of skill as a warrior, but that was perhaps enhanced through his uh, experience in battle. So, yes, we, we do have talents and abilities that come from God. In the first century, there were some well-known orators, such as Tertullus, who opposed Paul before the governor in Acts chapter 24 and verse 2. He had that ability, that ability to speak, uh, to command uh, attention, command respect from the governor, uh, he, he got that ability from God. Everyone ideally ought to acknowledge that whatever talents and abilities they have, they did get them from God. Uh, and they come from God even if the person does not acknowledge that, even if the person is not a Christian, even if the person uh, does not even believe in God. The irony is they still got their talents and abilities from God. So um, we have men like this. Uh, we have men with uh, physical prowess and abilities, athletes and so forth, and everyone got these things from God. Uh, none of these people that we've been talking about we would count as being saved. Uh, one helped God's cause. The other two opposed it. So whether they're in favor of God or opposed to God, they still got their talents and abilities, their gifts, from God. And just as God sends the sunshine and the rain upon all, Matthew 5 and verse 45, just so he spreads uh, his, uh, does he spread his talents to all, both the godly and the ungodly. Uh, people may not recognize the sunshine and the rain coming from God either, but it does. So whether or not people recognize it is, is not the point. It does come from God. We have gifts, natural gifts from God. Now there's a follow-up question to this. What are some of the natural talents that are often confused with gifts from God, or what are some gifts from God that people may think are natural talents? Um, I'm not quite sure what this is getting at, but I would answer this. A natural talent is a gift from God, whether recognized or not, as we've already said. And so beyond that, it gets a little murky trying to distinguish some of the finer points of this. If there's a, a point there that we're not addressing, be sure and uh, express it a little more precisely and ask it again, and maybe we can deal with that further at a later time. But, uh, but talents and abilities are from God. All right, the third question we want to deal with, 
We have heard that where two or three are gathered, Jesus is among us. Is that related to worship? If so, must we always worship with one other person? Well, that's a good question. And in order to answer it, let's go to the context where this passage is found that is often quoted. We want to go to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, beginning with verse 15. Now this is immediately preceding the verse we want to look at. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Notice, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. In other words, we would be withdrawing fellowship from such a person, turning them over to Satan, as it were, and uh, so that they uh, would learn, uh, hopefully, humility and have the desire to repent of what they had done wrong and make things right. But now, consider the next three verses. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Actually, uh, this is one passage that uh, the New American Standard actually does better than the King James. Whatever you have bind on earth will, technically it is, will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will have, or loose on earth, will have been loosed in heaven. In other words, they're not dictating to heaven. They're following the dictates of heaven. Again, I say to you that if two or, uh, of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name... I am there in the midst of them. So we're dealing in a passage where somebody has been withdrawn from. They are following the dictates of heaven. They are binding on earth what has been bound in heaven, loosing on earth what has been loosed in heaven. And uh, so if they are in agreement, if those witnesses, two or three, are in agreement then this is what ought to be done. So this is not talking about gathering together for worship at all. That's not even in the context. And uh, this has often been used in that way. Uh, it's been used to apply to worship ever since I can remember. And, and that's been a few days. So uh, this is, needs to be corrected. And we need to know that uh, this is only in the fulfilling of carrying out the responsibility of following the word of God and withdrawing fellowship from those who refuse to follow the word of God, who are called Christians, uh, then we have the authority of God. We are acting in the authority of God. He is with us. He is in the midst of us as this decision is made. And, uh, but let's answer the other part. Of the question. Uh, do we need another person for worship? Well, it's not talking about worship, and no, we don't need another person in order to be able to worship. Is prayer worship? Don't we count prayer as worship? What about Jesus' prayer in John 17? Did someone else have to be with him before he could pray that? Well, of course not. It was worship. What about in Acts 9? we see that Ananias was sent to Saul, who had been uh, praying. Behold, he prayeth. And uh, was that worship? Well, of, of course it was. He didn't need anybody else to be there. But even beyond these, you can worship. Uh, we need to worship collectively, but we can always worship alone, and sometimes even in the midst of other people. Take a look at this one from uh, Matthew chapter 8, 
uh, verses 1 and 2. And when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him. Well, I don't know that this was part of any kind of collective worship. There were other people maybe around, but the leper specifically came and worshipped Jesus, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean, which uh, he subsequently did. Also, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 18. While he spoke these things to them, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Uh, I believe there was many people gathered together there, but he came and paid homage to Christ. He worshipped him. So uh, you can uh, worship in the midst of other people. You can worship totally by yourself. No, you do not need someone else to make your worship valid. All you need is you and God. All right, let's go to question number four. Was Ahab Israel's most evil and worst king? Well, um, in a sense, he was. We want to go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 25 and 26, which uh, basically says that. 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. But notice how, how uh, the evil is worded here. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness uh, in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel his wife stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out of the children of Israel. And so for the uh, uh, breadth and uh, girth of what he was doing, yes, he outdid everybody before him. He found ways to do evil more than anybody else had done. And that's what uh, the passage is basically saying. However, even God was moved by his humility. In uh, verses 27 through 29, So it was, when Ahab heard these words, that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. Ahab was a difficult person. There were times when he seemed to be rational, especially after the contest with the prophets of Baal. Ahab was convinced. Elijah ran before him into the city. You might have thought there was going to be a tremendous reform that followed that. Instead, Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, about this time tomorrow, you're going to be where my prophets are. Uh, in other words, dead. So she did stir him up. He was okay in the department of evil all by himself, but she encouraged him and goaded him even to do more things. And yet, he did seem to be reachable at certain times. But he did more evil in terms of evil to be done than anybody prior to him. Now, as far as the longest lasting effects, however, Consider 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse 21. 2 Kings 17, 21. Speaking of Jeroboam, the text says, For he tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit a great Sin And the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, and did not depart from them. 
it's bad enough for somebody to do evil in his own life. But Jeroboam, what he did, affected the nation of Israel from that point till their capture, till their being taken into captivity by Assyria. So he had the longest lasting effects, but Ahab did more personal, individual evil than any other person. And uh, we might just mention that in Judah, the most evil king was Manasseh, 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. Uh, he's kind of a combination. Uh, and I know and am aware of the fact that he repented, but uh, listen to these two verses. <clears throat> verses 3 and 4 from chapter 24. Surely the commandment of the Lord, uh, this came upon Judah, to remove them from his sight. So this is talking about the Babylonian captivity uh, in 586 B.C., where they were taken from Jerusalem, the third and final wave of captivity. And notice why. Because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also because of the innocent blood that he had shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Now, he personally repented, and uh, you can look for him one day in heaven. I'm not sure. He may be there since he did repent. But his deeds could not be undone, and they were the reason for the captivity. So he did worse than everybody before him in terms of shedding innocent blood, and he was the reason they were taken captive. So that's uh, a little bit about the kings of Israel. Number five, the fifth question we want to look at this evening. Hmm. Let's see. This is not working. Let me try the space bar. Okay. Did Judas betray Jesus for the money or because he submitted or was possessed by Satan? And there are some scriptures that mention Judas and uh, the things that he did. Well, there's no uh, question that Judas was a covetous person. Let's go to John chapter 12 and uh, look at verses 3 through 5. Oh, you want that? All right. John uh, chapter 12, verses 3 through 5. <clears throat> then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of this oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was put into it. So as he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver... There is no question but what he is greedy. There's no question about his covetousness, uh, covetousness. But the text also says that Satan entered into him. And uh, all these verses attest to that fact. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that Satan entered him and had full control over him and he lost his free will and no, that's not what that means. Here's what it means. Righteous alternatives have been dismissed. All the things that he might have done that were right, all of the talking himself out of doing what he was doing, that's all been dismissed. He's turned his back on those alternatives. 
An evil action will occur unless something intervenes. And uh, so that's the basic meaning of what it means for Satan to enter someone. And that is that, you know, they have gotten rid of every other alternative. This course of action has been determined and nothing is going to stop it. That is what happens when Satan enters into a person. On one occasion, David determined... No, that didn't help. Uh, on one occasion, David determined to number Israel. Remember this? And Joab, of all people, who had uh, his own problems with sin tried to talk him out of it because he recognized that it was wrong. But David would not be talked out of it. He was determined. He was focused on what he wanted to do. And in a sense, you could say Satan entered him in order to be able to accomplish this fact. Uh, on another occasion, David had decided that he would kill all of those in Nabal's house. Some more technical things here. Uh, uh, he was going to murder his entire household because Nabal had refused, even though they were having a huge feast and it was harvest time, Nabal had refused to give any uh, gifts of food, any, uh, anything that would have blessed David and his men, who had protected him from marauding bands. He refused to do that, and as a response, David was determined to wipe out his entire household, and he and his men were on their way when, ah, okay, when Abigail came out and bowed before David and said, please consider this wrong upon me. And uh, she humbled herself. David stopped with what he had intended to do. But his mind had been made up. And he would have gone ahead with it had she not intervened. Well, you might say Satan enters a person when they make up their minds as to some course of action. And then uh, are going to follow through with it unless something happens. When somebody refuses to submit to God and refuses to resist the devil, James chapter 4 and verse 7, he will often end up rebelling against God and giving place to Satan. Satan enters a person figuratively when God and his righteousness are fully cast behind his back and he is determined to take a course of action resulting in sin. And uh, you have a couple of examples of that uh, on the overhead there. But let's get on to question number six. What size church has all these special groups of people to help? 10, 50, 100, 1,000? In order to help the sick, the hungry, and the poor, prisoners, widows, and orphans. Well, in one sense, the size of a congregation is irrelevant because the scriptures tell us, as we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men. So if we see a need and we have the means to help, then we ought to do it. Uh, and so in one sense, it doesn't matter how large the congregation is. However... Uh, we also want to realize Jesus did not say to go to, into all the world and set up social programs. You don't find that in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 or any other passage. However, uh, a large congregation uh, does have the opportunity to and, and has certain advantages. Notice that brethren had a program for widows in Jerusalem, and Paul would later give qualifications for what constituted a widow indeed in 1 Timothy 5. 
And so that's nothing wrong with having a program. If you happen to be quite large and there happens to be a need uh, in that area, but that's not to say that various programs are bound upon all churches everywhere, regardless of their size. This congregation concentrates on preaching the gospel throughout the year uh, and throughout the world. Every year we give $40,000 plus to missionaries in various places, as has been mentioned earlier today. But we have also stepped up to help in benevolent causes time and again. So we don't restrict ourselves to those types of things. But uh, when we have opportunity, we take advantage of it. We do not have the resources to help every good work. Uh, Yvonne brought in a thing the other night and said, why aren't we helping these brethren? Well, that, that's a good question. But the point is, there are good works all over the world, and we cannot possibly help each and every one. There is just no way. There are programs uh, in India, in Africa, in South America, and we're not talking about one or two programs in each one of those. We're talking literally about hundreds. There is no way we could, we could bring in a good work every week, but we, can't, we don't have the resources. No congregation does to be able to help each and every one of them. So we usually select a few and run with them. And sometimes they cease needing help and we'll maybe consider some other work that seems worthy. But in all cases, we try to, uh, as we have opportunity, uh, help those who are in need. Now, the last question. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, is God talking to people in his church or outside of the church? Well, that's a good question. Let's start with Matthew 25, 1 through 13, the parable of the ten virgins. They all seem to belong to God, all ten of them. Or Matthew 25, 14 through 30, the next thing about the parable of the talents, where one was given five, one, two, and another one, one, and then we have the description of what each one did with what he was given. Both of these begin with, the kingdom of heaven is like. And so these would seem then to be applying to those who are saved. But... Matthew 25, 31 through 46 says, All nations will be gathered together before him. Of course, individuals will be judged first and foremost by whether or not the blood of Christ has washed away their sins. But after that, there are other considerations, and one of them would be the matter of compassion. Well, isn't everyone compassionate? Isn't everyone generous? We might think so, living in America where generally a lot of people are, but the rich man was not. He allowed Lazarus to sit at his gate full of sores, hungry, being a beggar, rather than as he had an opportunity helping him. So no, not everybody has compassion as they ought. Or what about the selfish farmer in Luke 12, 15 through 21, where he talked about my barns and now I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns and say to myself, soul, eat, drink, uh, you have many things laid up for many years. Where do you see any thought of anybody else? It's all him, it's all for him. And thus he has asked the question, uh, Tonight you shall die, and then whose will these things be? So yes, there are people who lack compassion. And we ought to take seriously what Jesus says in Matthew 25 concerning that. Some are sticklers for orthodoxy, wanting to dot every I and cross every T, which is exactly the right thing to do, by the way. But... 
When it comes to giving away their assets, they tend to favor Nabal than the woman a widow with two mites. So it's something to be very careful about, not to be stingy or like Nabal, who wouldn't help David and his men, even, even at a harvest time where everything was totally in abundance, and yet he refused to help. He was so stingy. So what do we learn then from the seven questions? And we did get them all in, <laughs> which amazes me. But number one, be compassionate and generous as you have the opportunity. Second, resist the devil rather than submit to him. Don't make up your mind, this is going to occur no matter what, especially if it's not a righteous action that you're involved in. Resist the devil. Don't give in to him. Resist him. And number three, worship God and use your talents and gifts on his behalf. Don't, don't be hogging them to yourself. That's not going to help the congregation. That's not going to help people in the world if we keep our talents to ourselves and our gifts to ourselves. They must be exercised. And we need to take that to heart. Well, we did mention that there is a day of judgment. And the question always is, are we ready for that day? We're not perfect. We do fall short. Uh, we sometimes don't have the time to do all the things that we would like to do. Or maybe sometimes we're a little bit on the lazy side and could do more than what we're doing. But the fact is, we are all going to stand in the judgment and our we prepared for that. Being prepared for that does mean being benevolent in how we deal with others. And it also means that we must be a child of God, which can only happen if we repent of the sins we have committed, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and are baptized into Jesus Christ so that our sins can be washed away. Are you prepared for the eventuality of the judgment? If not, we will try to help you this evening to be in a better frame of mind regarding that. Please come if you need to while we stand and while we sing. <laughs>